book tour. This is part of it. Yeah. And uh, we're really glad to have you here. So I'll give you the floor and um, thank you for coming. Well, maybe I'll start standing up. Well, how, how uh, appropriate to be in, in uh, Berkeley when you're talking about the 60s, I guess. And <laughs> that's what this book is a lot about. Uh, and of course, Friday, Friday will be 40 years from uh, the date of the raid that took Fred Hampton's life. So anyhow, uh, I'll begin by, I've already seen people who I haven't seen in a long time. It's really kind of fun to see folks who I either know or, but haven't seen. And you write a memoir and it's like reliving your life and then you go on a book tour and you see all the people who were part of that life. It's kind of, is, is, is uh, a duplication of that, but it, it's very exciting. And anyway, uh, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and my, uh, a little bit about my background, and I talk about this in the book because I sort of contrast my growing up with Fred Hampton's growing up. And I grew up in Atlanta, um, I'm in a middle class Jewish family. My grandfather was the lawyer that a man named Leo Frank called when he was arrested. And Leo Frank was the manager of the Atlanta Pencil Factory. And he was accused of killing one of his employees, a young 13-year-old uh, girl who worked at the Pencil Factory. And the, it became a big anti-Semitic issue because he had lived in New York. He came down to Atlanta. The Hearst papers picked up the, the case. And in, in fact, uh, he went to trial. And the, the people in the courtroom were with, with, with rocks and bottles ready to stone the jury if they didn't find him guilty and give him the death penalty. And they did, and uh, actually the governor of Georgia commuted his sentence to life. And I have some of the letters that uh, he wrote to my grandfather, but after he was, uh, his sentence had been commuted and he was downstate Georgia in Milledgeville, a lynch mob came from Atlanta, took him out of the prison and lynched him uh, in Marietta, near Atlanta. And my grandfather and the whole Jewish community in Atlanta was very much set back by that event. Uh, it was the, actually the founding event of the Anti-Defamation League. But also, one of the interesting things, they'd never exactly correlated that with the fact that 14 black men were lynched in, in Georgia that same year without any trials at all. So it was kind of a, a mixed message uh, that, 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 that I got. My dad was, uh, did do civil rights work. He worked with John Lewis and he worked with the Voter Education Project. And when my dad died five years ago, um, I had the pleasure of reading a eulogy written to my dad by John Lewis saying he was one of the unsung heroes of the Civil Rights Movement. And my mom also had come down from Cleveland and she uh, played a role. She started an organization called the Atlanta Committee for International Visitors. And in the 50s, Atlanta was sort of the showplace for the South where they brought international delegations, particularly from Africa, to show here's a southern city that's dealing with its desegregation in a non-violent way. And she got the hotels who, who would say, all right, we'll, 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 uh, your delegation from Africa can come and stay here, but not with their white chaperones. We won't take a mixed delegation. So my mom said, no, you either take the whole thing or nothing. And it had a role in integrating the, hotel, the hotels in Atlanta. But even though it was a very liberal family, um, I also was a white Southerner. Uh, like many middle class white Southerners, I was raised by black people to a large extent. Uh, we moved to a farm outside of Atlanta because my mom, it was sort of a hobby of hers, and this black man named Walter was the person we hired. And he was somebody I totally idolized. He wore overalls and, and drank, tea, uh, drank iced tea out of fruit jars. And, he taught me how to plow, and he taught me and drive a tractor and fill a hay wagon. And uh, I, w he was, I was sort of, uh, he was, he was uh, my gym and sort of I was his huck, but we didn't travel the Mississippi. We did go to the baseball games in Atlanta, and Walter used to take me and my friend. And uh, when we got to, the, the, the ball, baseball team in Atlanta was the Atlanta Crackers. And so he used to take us to the baseball game uh, the only problem was Walter had to go sit out in the, on the hill in right field. And my friend Henry and I, we sat, of course, in the stands. And Atlanta was totally segregated at that time. And we knew it was 
outrageous that he could take us to the ballpark but couldn't, couldn't sit with us. But that was what the city was like. And another thing, on, 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 uh, once a year, we would go to uh, the symphony, would, would, would play for all the public school kids in Atlanta. So, but they couldn't, the black kids and the white kids couldn't go at the same time. The white kids would go at nine and the black kids would go at 10.30. So I was in a car with my classmates, I was sort of a rural school, and they were yelling racial slurs at the black kids as we were, as they were going to the symphony and we were coming home. And I remember my mom said, well, it's cold in here, let's put up the windows. But we didn't really confront a lot of the racism that was around us. I think as white Southerners, we, you know, it somewhat made cowards of us all that we had to see so much and probably, and really took on so little. And so that's a lot what, what I remember of Atlanta. Um, I'll read one portion here uh, of a high school. When I was a high school senior in 1960, one of the few hip things I did was frequenting the Royal Peacock Social Club on Auburn Avenue, where you could drink if you were under 21. It was on the second floor, a couple of blocks from the Ebenezer Baptist Church, headed by Martin Luther King Sr. and his son. The Peacock had the best music in town and was the city's only integrated nightclub part of the Chitlin circuit, its patrons were 90% black. The white 10% was mostly Jewish. Whites were usually seated together, but the warm feelings in that room were unique for me at that time. I think the black people knew we came there to appreciate their music and their scene. Otis Redding, Sam Cooke, Aretha Franklin, B.B. King, and Marvin Gaye made regular appearances at the Peacock. We brought our own half pint bottles of bourbon or Seagram 7 inside our coat pockets and poured generous amounts into the paper cups of Coke we bought for mixers. Packed in there together at the table or on the dance floor, even I lost my inhibitions, overcoming my self-consciousness enough to do a little making out. The band I remember best was Hank Ballard and the Midnighters. Hank wrote the original music and lyrics to The Twist. Unfortunately for him, he let Chubby Checker record it, and Hank never quite made it past being a regional hero. Hank and the Midnighters put on quite a show. Somewhere toward the conclusion of their act, the room darkened, the music started quietly and slowly and then gradually picked up its tempo. Suddenly a spotlight appeared directly on <coughs> Hank. He had a pair of women's panties draped over his head. He slowly removed them using his tongue as the music got louder and the beat got stronger. The audience, black and white, clapped to the beat as the panties slowly descended. When they were gone, the audience erupted. It was crude, and I loved it. At one or two in the morning, climbing down the stairs from the syrupy warmth of the peacock onto Auburn Avenue, I felt like I was putting on my white skin again and separating into the two familiar worlds of black and white. I left Atlanta after high school, and I went to the University of Michigan, and then the University of Chicago Law School. Red Hampton had a very different childhood for me. His parents came from Louisiana. Both his mother and father grew up on farms where their grandparents had been slaves. And they, like many Southerners, moved to the west side of Chicago where there were factory jobs. And Iberia Hampton, Fred's mother, uh, took a job at Corn Products and eventually so did his father. And there, Iberia met uh, Mamie Till and her son Emmett Till, and actually Iberia Hampton babysat for Emmett Till uh, when she first came to Chicago. I'm probably most of you are familiar with the story of Emmett Till. Uh, when he was 14 or 15, he went back to Moni, Mississippi, was in a store and supposedly either winked at or whistled or didn't look or looked a white woman in the face, and he paid for that with his life. And uh, he, was, uh, he was kidnapped, brutally beaten, uh, murdered and his body was thrown in the river and he actually was the Mississippi authorities didn't want to release his body to his, his mother in Mississippi and they said we'll do it as long as you don't open the coffin but when the body came back and was at the Rainer funeral home uh, Mamie Till said no I want the world to see what southern racist violence is like and she took she did to open the coffin and everybody saw and it was all over the country the picture of, of Emmett Till. 
And that was at the Rainer Funeral Home in 1955. 14 years later, Fred Hampton was lying in that same funeral home after the police raid. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'll go back to, well anyway, the, the Hampton family moved to the west uh, uh, suburb, a suburb of Maywood, which was a, a working class suburb. And uh, Fred uh, grew up there and Fred uh, used to or pick up all the kids on Saturday morning and bring them over to his house and, and cook breakfast for everybody. And he knew some of the kids didn't get breakfast at home. And it was like Fred had his own breakfast for children program when he was 10 years old. He was, uh, Fred had a big head when he was a kid and people used to call him peanut head. And to make up for that, he became very good at, at retort. And so people said in Chicago, he was the king of the nines or the dozens as it's called in some places and nobody took on Fred's mouth. Another thing he did is he had a lisp, actually somewhat like Emmett Till did supposedly. And Fred to overcome that just practiced speaking and he memorized the speeches of Malcolm X and of Dr. King. And he went to, with his parents to church and picked up the rhythm and the cadence of the, the, the preachers at the church. And so Fred's eloquence didn't come from nowhere. He, he had practiced it. When Fred got to high school, uh, he, some of the, his family says well, it was never an injustice that, that Fred could, could accept. He used to say, if you go through life and don't help anybody, you really haven't had much of a life. So one of the first things he noticed when he got to Proviso East High School was black girls were not being considered uh, for homecoming queens. So he led a walkout at the school for that, and the next year there was a black girl who was the homecoming queen. But he continued and he began to organize and demand more black teachers and more black administrators. Uh, very much like Huey Newton and Bobby Seale were doing out here at Merritt College, also asking for more black teachers and, and, and administrators, Fred did that in, at Proviso East. And he had the respect of all the students, and actually the, the principal called on Fred when there was a racial disturbance because he could talk to both the blacks and the whites and get them to resolve their differences. And Fred was uh, seen as, as, as such a leader the head of the, uh, the uh, West Side neighborhood NAACP youth chapter, they said, we want this young man to be the head of the NAACP on the West Side in the youth. And he was, and within about a year, it grew from like 14 members to like 200 members. And Fred continued to demonstrate and, and to, 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 to speak out against the injustices. And one of the first things he did is he actually led a march for more uh, higher pay for the police and then he led another march for the police becoming accountable and so that they could be fired if they abused the citizens. One of the issues also that Fred uh, got very much involved in was there was no place for black kids in Maywood to swim. The white kids could go to a nearby veterans park that was segregated. So Fred led a march to the city council in, in, uh, in, in Maywood with, a, with about 100, 100 people demanding a recreation center. 50, about half got in, and when he's negotiating to get the other half in, the police opened fire, uh, used tear gas uh, against Fred, I mean against the people on the outside. They ran away and they broke some windows, uh, and then they ended up charging Fred with mob action and criminal damage to property, even though he was inside at the time this happened. An interesting thing that I just discovered and these things, you know, you learn more and more as you go along, but this document was declassified after our lawsuit, but even that demonstration which he led in 1968, before there was a Panther Party in, 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 uh, in, in Chicago, that J. Edgar Hoover was sending around a memo to the White House, the CIA, and the Department of the Army talking about this young leader leading this group of people to the Maywood City Council and sent that around. We actually actually have that, that memo. So that was how much, how much fear there was of, of Hoover and the FBI of any kind of black independent leadership at that time. Fred evolved very much similar to the way uh, other people in the black movement. He uh, was very much interested in black power. He began to collect black history books. He started a library in Maywood. He became very, he, for a, mo a little while, he started working with Stokely and Rap Brown. He introduced Stokely at the, on the west side. And then when Stokely and Rap joined the party, 
Bobby Rush, who's now a congressman, went out to the West Coast and came back to Chicago and started a Panther chapter. And the first person he said he wanted to have in the as his to work with him was Fred Hampton. So in November of 1968, the Panthers started with a mandate from the West Coast to, to start a chapter, uh, and Fred Hampton was the chairman, Bobby Rush was the defense minister. And the Panthers really took off in Chicago. They started a breakfast program on the west side at the Better Boys Foundation, which expanded to other places. They were going around getting signatures on petitioner, petitions for community control of police. They were selling a lot of newspapers. They eventually started a health clinic. And they were also very confrontational with the police. There was an incident uh, that fall when two brothers, the Soto brothers, were actually murdered by the police on the west side of Chicago. They were organizing, again, sort of like what was going on on the west coast, to get a stoplight put between the housing project they live in and the, and the clinic, uh, where the kids would go and two kids had already been hit. One man was uh, organizing, his brother came home from Vietnam. In one march, one of them was shot and killed by the police when his brother uh, extended his stay from Vietnam. He was also killed. And these were very, uh, to the west side, and, and, and Fred talked about the murder of the Soto brothers a lot. Another thing that happened in Maywood, an ice cream truck robbery, uh, happened. There was a, a vendor of ice cream at the local school and somebody went in the, the, the truck and held the vendor down and passed out 71 bars of ice cream to the neighborhood kids. The police went and, and brought the vendor back and, got, and had him identify Fred as the person who had done this. And uh, Fred said he didn't. And, but anyway, they charged him with armed robbery, or they charged him with robbery, even though it should have been a theft kind of offense. And Fred had to go to trial on that. Um, it would have been, uh, Fred was convicted in March of 69. And normally the sentence, you know, for a first offender with no injuries and minimum property damage, he would have gotten probation. But there was a very ambitious prosecutor in Chicago at that time named Edward Hanrahan. And Hanrahan was running on the political platform of a war on gangs. And he was, He'd, he'd considered the Panthers a gang. So between the time when Fred was convicted and when his sentencing came up, he was, uh, ha uh, Hanrahan held a press conference and said that Fred Hampton should go to prison, he shouldn't be out in the streets, and the judges who were very much uh, dependent upon the, the machine support, but the judge gave Fred two to five years, and he gets sent down to Menard Prison. And this is in 1969. Now. As I mentioned, I went to the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, I was in Chicago at this time, uh, in the, a little earlier than this. And uh, I had two pretty interesting classmates. Uh, one was a guy named John Ashcroft, who we've probably heard of. Uh, although I, I have almost no memory of him. I think people with his politics were pretty quiet in the 60s. They just, maybe they knew their day was coming. But he, all I remember is he played left field on the softball team and I played right field. <laughs> Probably should have been the opposite, but anyway, that's what that's what uh, that's what happened. My other classmate, who has left a, a, a big impression on me, is Bernadine Dorn, and Bernadine uh, was the head of the law school's the Civil Rights Research Council, and she actually sent me down to Atlanta to work with a black civil rights firm, Howard, uh, with, that in, included Howard Moore, who ended up coming out here. And so I actually, uh, my same friend Henry, who wants to go to the ball game with me, Howard Moore says to us one day, well look, why don't you go out, there's a restaurant in Crawfordsville called the Bonner Supper Club. And I, they claim they're a club, but I, why don't you guys go and prove that they're not? Now in the, in the mid-60s, a lot of restaurants tried to get around the public accommodations law by calling themselves private clubs. So Henry and I go out to the Bonner uh, Supper Club, and sure enough, our color of our skin is our price of admission to the club and we get served and it looked like it was going to go pretty smooth except this big fat sheriff comes and sits, sits down next to us and starts small talk uh, like where y'all from and how come you're here and the food wasn't good enough to go all the way out there for, for it so we didn't really have a good answer. I think I said I was on my way to Savannah but he didn't know geography much better than I did because it's really not on the way to Savannah but anyway we got out of there and before we left, I asked the waitress, could you give me a receipt? And would you 
right down, you know, and, and she pulls off one of those green little sheets that you, doesn't show anything. And says, so would you write down the name of your restaurant and the date? And she looked very skeptical, but she did. And uh, so we left and I gave it to Howard Moore with a, uh, an affidavit saying we had gone there. We hadn't had to pay for any club membership. And six months later at law school, he sends me a, a note saying that the Bonner Supper Club is no longer uh, segregated. But anyway, I guess I really began to get much more radicalized in the 60s at law school. There was so much going on. We were sort of a white school in the middle of a black community. Uh, Dr. King had marched on the west side of Chicago in 67. Uh, Fred Hampton marched with Dr. King. Apparently was, according to someone, was with him when a, a woman he was with got spat on or spit upon. And Fred said, I'm not going to do this uh, nonviolent uh, marching anymore when the crowds against us are violent. Uh, I was with Dr. King when 68, when we had marched in downtown Chicago, and he, it was the first time, even before Riverside Church, that Dr. King came out against the war in Vietnam. And he spoke directly, and I remember how excited we were. All of a sudden, the Civil Rights Movement seemed like the Black Power Movement, the anti-war movement were all coming together. And it was a, you know, a time of tremendous excitement. Uh, you had the Democratic Convention in 68. Of course, you also had the assassination of Dr. King in April. You had Robert Kennedy being assassinated. And it just seemed like the world was, was moving forward very rapidly. And Fred Hampton, who had always been really interested in justice, had, had even taken some pre-law courses and said he wanted to become a lawyer. But by 68, he was saying, well, I don't have time now. There's too much happening. I need to be a leader, a leader, a leader in the community. So our lives began to, when, when, it, when we left, when I left uh, the University of Chicago, I worked for Legal Aid, and then a group of us uh, at Legal Aid were watching all this stuff going on with the Panthers. The Young Lords started in Chicago. There was a white group, the Young Patriots. There was the anti-war movement. And we said, we want to be lawyers for the movement. So we left and we started uh, in a former sausage shop on Halstead Street in Lincoln Park and declared ourselves the People's Law Office because we wanted to be lawyers for the movement groups and in particular for the Panthers. So after Fred got convicted and was sent down to Menard, one of the first things my partners did uh, was get him out on an appeal bond. So in August of 1969, Fred gets out on an appeal bond. He comes and speaks at the People's Church on the west side of Chicago and Flint Taylor, my partner, my, my law partner, and I went and heard Fred speak. I'm going to My colleague Flint Taylor and I found an opening in a row about halfway back. After a few minutes, things quieted down. There was a hush. A moment later, Fred emerged from the side and strode to the pulpit. Everyone stood up and clapped. The walls shook with the thunder of 300 voices chanting, Free Fred Hampton. Unlike at other Panther events, <clears throat> Fred was not surrounded by Panthers in leather jackets and black berets. He stood alone, dressed in a button-down shirt with a pullover sweater. He was 20 years old with smooth, youthful skin and a boyish smile. He had grown a little goatee in prison and wore a medium-length afro. Fred Hampton held a microphone in his right hand and looked out at the crowd. I'm free, he began in a loud voice, then repeated it. People shouted their approval. His voice got softer. I went down to the prison in Menard thinking we were the vanguard, but down there I got down on my knees and listened and learned from the people. I went down to the valley and picked up the beat of the people. A drum beat started and everyone clapped to the rhythm. Fred chanted, a cross between a Baptist preacher and Sly and the Family Stone, I'm high. Making each high into a two-syllable word, he sang, I'm high, I'm high off the people, and then chanted the words again. It was impossible for me not to join in and soon I clapped and stomped with everyone else. When the refrain was over, Fred repeated the most common Panther slogan, power to the people, but added his own variation. White power to white people, brown power to brown people, yellow power to yellow people, black power to black people, X power to those we left out, 
Fred had a good sense of humor that sometimes people forget. And Panther Power to the Vanguard Party. After a volley of write-ons, Fred said, if you ever think about me and you ain't going to do no revolutionary act, forget about me. I don't want myself on your mind if you're not going to be to work for the people. If you're asked to make a commitment at the age of 20 and you say I don't want to make a commitment at the age of 20 only because of the reason that I'm too young to die, I want to live a little longer, then you're dead already. You have to understand that people have to pay a price for peace. If you dare to struggle, you dare to win. If you dare not struggle, then damn it, you don't deserve to win. Let me say peace to you if you're willing to fight for it. Later, Fred asked the audience to stand up. We did. He then told everyone to raise his or her right hand and repeat, I am, and we responded, I am. He then said, a revolutionary, and some in the audience repeated, a revolutionary. I considered myself a lawyer for the movement, but not necessarily of the movement. The word revolutionary stuck in my throat. Again, Fred repeated, I am. And the audience responded in kind. This time when he said a revolutionary, the response was louder. By the third or fourth time, I hesitantly joined in. And by the seventh or eighth time, I was shouting as loudly and enthusiastically as everyone else, I am a revolutionary. It was the threshold to which Fred took me and countless others. I felt my level of commitment palpably rising. Fred now was speaking in a quieter voice. I believe I was born not to die in a car wreck or slipping on a piece of ice or of a bad heart, but I'm going to die, be able to die doing the things I was born for. I believe I'm going to die high off the people. I believe that I'm going to be able to die as a revolutionary in the international proletarian struggle. And I hope that each of you will be able to die in the international revolutionary proletarian struggle, or you'll be able to live in it. And I think that struggle's going to come. Why don't you live for the people? Why don't you struggle for the people? Why don't you die for the people? Fred finished. Everyone stood and applauded again, unaware of the truth of his prophecy. We chanted, Free Fred Hampton, and the church reverberated with the clapping and stamping of feet. So that was in August of 1969. We continued to be the, the lawyers for the Panthers. Uh, the police, there were at least three shootouts the police opened fire on the Panther offices twice, and once the FBI came in, supposedly looking for a fugitive who it turned out was an FBI informant who conveniently always left the offices that they were searching right before the police came. Um, and after all of these raids, either the police and the FBI would totally tear up the Panther office, would, see, would turn the food for the breakfast program on the ground, would steal the membership list, would steal whatever, um, uh, money there was uh, and, and it wasn't returned and often they would also beat up the people that, that were inside. On December 2nd of 1969 uh, the Panthers decided they wanted to buy their building on Madison Street because the, the landlord was always threatening them with eviction because they were always you know getting shot at by the police and so they figured they weren't doing much for the property value so they figured if they owned their own place uh, maybe that then um, uh, that at least they wouldn't they wouldn't be evicted. So I went over there. I had done some low and moderate income housing work at Legal Aid. So I was picked to go over uh, and talk to talk to Fred and negotiate uh, the, the purchase of this building. This was on de December second. I went to the office the following afternoon and stood on the street outside, out, outside the steel door. Bullet holes from the previous police attacks marred the building's facade. Two faded posters with the panther emblem hung on each side of the door. I pushed the buzzer and cleared my throat. This is Jeff from the People's Law Office and I have a meeting with Chairman Fred at four o'clock, I said. After a pause, the door was, open, was buzzed open. At the top of the steep staircase, another door opened, and I was led into the large open space that made up the main office. It hummed with noise and activity. Around, around me, people were criticizing each other about a snafu that morning, getting the food delivered on time to one of the breakfast program locations. There were stacks of Panther papers on the floor in the corner, and on some of the desks, I saw piles of signed papers titled Petition for Community Control of Police. Boxes of cereal and pancake mixed 
Donations to the breakfast program were piled in another corner. After a few minutes, Fred emerged. Before I could introduce myself, I wasn't sure if he knew who I was. He smiled, hello, Jeff, come on in. I followed him to the side, to the office in the back where he sat down at a wooden desk. It was hot in the office and Fred wore a t-shirt. I took off my suit jacket and faced him. I got the person who's giving the money ready to go. Can we close tomorrow, he asked, clearly in a hurry to complete the purchase. I said, I have to draw up a deed and get the owner to meet us and sign it. Then he asked me, how's that housing plan coming? Fred interrupted, referring to the proposal for low and moderate income housing sponsored by the coalition of the Panthers, the Young Lords, and the Young Patriots. I have to file our proposal with the Department of Urban Renewal on Thursday morning. It really looks good. Uh, how about if I meet you and the owner here Thursday afternoon, which would have been December 4th? Fred agreed. Buying the Panther building was not the kind of real estate deal where the, an inspection was required. The Panthers knew every crack in the plaster and bullet hole in the ceiling because they had repaired the office after each of the three police raids. How's the boiler? Have you checked that out? I asked. You can see we got plenty of heat, except when the police bullets give us too much ventilation, he replied, a slow smile spreading across his face. We put some cement in our walls when we opened the People's Law Office last August. Maybe you should try that, I said, only half joking. It's the windows they shoot at, not the walls, Fred said, but I'll check it out. He said, let's get it done quick. As we were walking up to the front, Fred paused in our conversation to talk to some Panthers who had entered the office. This handsome, powerfully built man of 21, six years my junior, was giving instructions. Show up on time for the breakfast program. Sell your quarter of Panther papers. Be a political education class on Monday and Wednesday night. Fred was talking continuously, asking questions and answering them. His voice had the staccato tempo and energy of a rapper. There were few pauses and a lot of rhythm. He seemed to be driven by some inner force that created a continuous flow of orders and encouragement. Even though he appeared relaxed and jovial, there was a sense of urgency to his directions. The Panthers appeared to run on Fred's energy. He stopped for a moment to thank me. I'll see you Thursday, power to the people. I answered, power to the people. Opening the door and leaving, I hoped I was playing a small role in helping the Panthers gain self-determination, at least over their own building. So that was, that was Tuesday, and Wednesday I had to work on this housing proposal and I was up all night. If you remember what it took when you had to write a document that could have no mistakes in it, you had to use correcto tape and white out and carbon paper. And then if you added a paragraph, you had to retype the whole thing. So I was with a, uh, uh, I, I went to a, a, somebody who was a, uh, actually a woman who was typing this paper for me in, the, in our office. So I came home about, about seven in the morning, uh, or actually about, it was about five or 6.30 in the morning. Um, and my partner, uh, I had just gotten home and it was Thursday morning, it was about 6.30 and about seven o'clock I got a knock on the door. I'd just fallen asleep when I heard a loud knock at the front door. Dazed, I got up and opened it. My partner, Skip Andrew, was standing there dressed in suit and tie. Chairman Fred is dead, I just got a call from Rush. The pigs vamped on the chairman's crib this morning. I remained stuck on the words, Chairman Fred is dead. Someone else was killed and a lot of people were shot. Deborah Johnson and some others are at the Wood Street Police Station. The people wounded are at Cook County Hospital. What, what should I do, I asked. I'm meeting Rush at the morgue and then we are going to the chairman's crib. Why don't you go to Wood Street and try to talk to some of the survivors? Sure, I stammered. He turned abruptly and was gone down the steps. Fred Hampton dead? I had just seen him at the Panther office looking bigger than life. I couldn't imagine him motionless. I replayed Skip's words in my mind, the chairman is dead. It was Fred who made us believe we were strong and unstoppable. Now he was dead. So while Skip went to the apartment to gather evidence, I went to the Wood Street Police Station in Chicago, and there after encountering some resistance, uh, finally got in to see Deborah Johnson, who was Fred's fiance. She was eight and a half months pregnant with their child at that time. It was cold in the tiny windowless interview room at the Wood Street Police Station. I looked across the wooden table at the large boned woman with a short afro who was shaking and sobbing. 
Deborah Johnson's patterned nightgown outlined her protruding belly, revealing her pregnancy. Fred never really woke up, she said. He was lying there when they pulled me out of the bedroom. She paused. And then I asked. Two pigs went back into the bedroom. One of them said, he's barely alive. He'll barely make it. I heard two shots. Then I heard, he's good and dead now. Fred's fiance looked at me with sad, swollen eyes. What can you do? I couldn't think of any reply. I couldn't bring Fred back to life. And that's how my morning started on December 4th of 1969. While I was interviewing the survivors, my partners Flint, uh, Flint Taylor and Skip Andrew went to the apartment. And for some reason that we never quite understood, the police did not seal off the murder scene. And it turned out that two Panthers, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, a brother from Peoria, were killed. Four Panthers were shot, and three were just beaten up by the police. But they left the scene, uh, and they didn't, didn't cordon it off, uh, and they didn't seal the apartment. So they went to gather the evidence, and Skip had the amazing presence of mind to bring a filmmaker, Mike Gray, with him to picture so that when, if you've seen the movie, The, the, the Murder of Fred Hampton, you see what they saw when they opened the door. The place had been totally torn up, uh, ransacked by the police, and there was blood and bullet holes everywhere. So while they're gathering the evidence and I'm interviewing the survivors, Ed Hanrahan goes on TV. And he has all these, he stands in front of a table with these weapons, which he says were seized from the Panther office. And there he gives the first, his first account of what happened, the Raiders account, which was they were innocently serving a search warrant when surprisingly they were open fire upon by the Panthers. And there was a, a deadly uh, shootout. Uh, the Panthers broke three ceasefires. And Fred Hampton, who was in this back bedroom uh, near this bed, fired at the police as they were coming in the back door. And Hanrahan pointed to the 45 that the officers claimed they found near Fred Hampton's body. And they said, this is, and they said Fred Hampton was shooting at the police as they came in the back door. When we gather, started gathering the evidence, it turned out that the bullet holes show what direction, uh, the trajectory show where the bullets were fired from. So if this was the apartment, the police came in the front door here, they came in the back door here, and Fred Hampton's bed would be over here. I can realize it's sort of around the corner, but anyway, more like this. The Panthers had a living room, a first bedroom, and the room where Fred Hampton and, and Deborah Johnson were. But when we gathered the evidence, we saw that all the bullets except one came from the direction of the police toward the Panthers. Uh, and you can tell when a bullet enters a wall if the entry hole is smaller, the exit hole is, is splayed wood, and you can tell the direction. And we, had, we, we, began, we filmed that. The only outbound shot was a shot from Mark Clark weapon as he was standing in the living room with a shotgun and he was shot in the heart and his shotgun, the uh, discharge from his shotgun went up in the air, probably an involuntary shot as he was dying because it wouldn't, if you were trying to shoot somebody you wouldn't shoot a bullet that went right up and hit the ceiling in the hallway outside. The Panthers were really very smart and so because the physical evidence in the apartment showed all these bullet holes coming in they began to lead tours through the apartment. And people began to see what really happened. And whereas the black community was divided about the Panthers, they were not divided about a young leader being killed in his bed at 4.30 in the morning by the police. And so the black community began to speak out. A young state senator named Harold Washington, uh, even Ralph Metcalf, who had been sort of a lackey of the mayor, a congressman spoke out. Renault Robinson, the head of the Afro-American Patrolman League, called it a murder. And uh, all of a sudden, Hanrahan was on the defensive because his story didn't jive with the evidence. So again, he goes to the media. Uh, he gives this exclusive story to the Chicago Tribune. <coughs> he says, well, you come, we're going to give you the real uh, story about what happened. You can interview the, the Raiders and everything. So the Tribune comes, and he gives the Tribune a picture of the back door, a photo, a police photo of the back door with two black dots in it. And he said, here's proof that the Panthers and Fred Hampton fired at the police as they came in the back door. And it was on a, 
front page of the, of the Tribune, and we invited the press out, and when they got out there, we said, well, look, and those two black dots were nail heads, they weren't bullet holes. <laughs> so Hanrahan's case began to come undone. The only other evidence, he still charged all the survivors with attempted murder on the, on the police. The only other evidence he claimed was those two shotgun shells, which a police uh, crime lab person claimed came from Panther weapon, but in fact, it came from a police weapon. When, when, a, when an FBI firearms examiner later looked at it, it was proven to come from a police weapon. So it was something like 90 to 1. The other thing that, two other things that showed up when we did an autopsy of Fred Hampton was in fact, the, he was killed by two bullets in coming into the top of his head as he was lying prone. So the, the, the bullets, and they appeared to be fired at point blank range. They weren't the shots that came through the walls that were hitting the bed below. So it fit the story that Deborah Johnson told us that he was actually murdered after she was pulled out of the room because she had gotten on top of him and she had no blood on her nightgown when I interviewed her. So he was actually shot after she was pulled out of the room when those two police officers entered. The other thing they found was seek a, 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 a almost lethal dose of, of cecobarbital in Fred's body, which is, is something that will put you to sleep or make you so drowsy. Fred didn't use drugs. As a matter of fact, forbid people to use, to use drugs or alcohol when they were doing Panther business. So there was always a question, well, how did Fred get these drugs in his system? So finally, Hanrahan was forced to drop the charges. So we, uh, who had been movement lawyers, uh, with support from a lot of National Lawyers Guild and Center for Constitutional Rights people, they came in. So why don't you file a civil rights suit against the police, the raiders? And we'd never been in federal court. We'd never done a civil suit. We were the criminal defense lawyers for the, for the movement. And what, more or less, this was a pretty big suit, taking on all these people, Hanrahan, the crime lab, the shooters, everybody. But we filed this lawsuit in 1970, uh, at least trying to, Iberia Hampton and, and Fanny Clark, Mark Clark's mother said, well, you know, they got to pay somehow. I mean, they can't just get away with this. So we filed a civil suit and we drew a terrible judge. His name was Sam Perry. He was 80 years old from Alabama. He was very much like Hoffman in a courtroom, uh, in the adjoining courtroom. And Perry despised our clients, the Panthers. He despised us, the young radical lawyers. And he specifically d d disliked the fact that we were saying the government murdered Fred Hampton in his bed. So he actually dismissed our lawsuit after two years uh, because he didn't because he said the the charges were scurrilous, not the the actions that were, were scurrilous, but the <laughs> fact that we named a murder that was what was scurrilous. So two and a half years in, um, our lawsuit gets dismissed. Hanrahan and the Raiders get charged with obstructing justice, but they uh, take a bench trial in front of a city of county appointed judge and they get acquitted. Uh, the only satisfaction we got was the black community revolted from the Democratic Party and Hanrahan never got elected to anything again. He ran for state's attorney, he ran for mayor, he ran for Congress and it was really the creation, the murder of Fred Hampton created a, a, a great, a much more independence uh, by blacks and liberals in the Democratic Party. It was that coalition, many people say, that actually elected Harold Washington as Chicago's mayor uh, several years later. But, so we're, but anyway, the, the Hanrahan's charges have been dismissed, our case has been dismissed, and we're wondering where we're gonna go when this sort of strange thing happened. Uh, well, two things happened. One is, there was a, a, a burglary of an FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania. And in that burglary, these draft dodgers found some FBI documents that described a, a, a FBI program called COINTELPRO, mm -hmm. Counterintelligence Program. And this program was aimed at the entire left uh, and to some extent, uh, at the, at, but focused much more on the black movement and the Panthers were the specific target, the, the highest uh, target of this program. I mean, Hoover said the Black Panthers are the greatest threat to the internal security of this country. And these documents showed that the FBI had set up a program whose purpose was to discredit the Panthers, whose purpose was to, to destroy, disrupt, and neutralize the Panthers, to cripple the breakfast program. These are what they described in their documents. 
They talked about preventing the coalition of the Panthers with any other groups. And there was one other objective that this program set out, and, he, and this was a memo that Hoover sent to every FBI office in the country where there was a Panther office, and it said, one of our objectives is to prevent the rise of a messiah who could unify and electrify the black movement. And we thought, this seems to fit. And, and, and they mentioned in the memo, well, Dr. King, could, because he was still alive, might be such a person, Stokely Carmichael might be such a person, even Elijah Muhammad. The memo was written a year and a half earlier. So there was this FBI program. Then we, it turns out in, in, in 73, uh, there's a federal case and it, a guy named William O'Neill uh, is, is uncovered in a trial. He and, and a Chicago policeman named Stanley Robinson were involved in shaking down drug dealers and murdering them. And when the police caught them, Stanley Robinson said, well, I, I was going along to, to turn in uh, William O'Neill. And William O'Neill said, I was going along with Stanley to turn him in. Well, I guess because O'Neill was the federal person, he ended up as the chief witness <coughs> in that case. But more important to us, O'Neill had been in the Panthers, and we knew William O'Neill. And he had been Fred's bodyguard, and he'd been head of security in the Panthers. And he was, he was uh, uh, a very flamboyant person. He was the opposite of what at least I at that time thought an informant is somebody who kind of tries to stay on the sidelines and, and be unobtrusive uh, and take mental notes. But, but William O'Neill was the opposite of that. He was a provocateur. He was always trying to urge the Panthers to do illegal things. He built a, an electric chair on the entrance to the Panther office, supposedly to deter informants from joining the Panthers. And he even built a mortar, supposedly, that could fly from the Panther office to City Hall until Fred told him to dismantle that. But O'Neill, we, we knew uh, he was very close to Fred. He had been in the apartment that night. We wondered, was O'Neill involved in some way in this, in this raid? Well, when we first took his deposition, O'Neill said, no, I really, you know, I respected Fred Hampton and he, he was a real leader and I didn't have anything to do with his death and so forth. But we kept, uh, we sort of, we, we sued O'Neill then and, and the other, and his control and the local FBI office. And then we got another memo that showed that a year before, December 4th, the FBI sent a memo to Jeff Fort who was the head of the Blackstone Rangers in Chicago, the largest and most well-armed street gang in Chicago. And the memo was written and approved by the leader head of the FBI, Marlon Johnson, in Chicago. And it read something like, and it was written on a blank sheet of paper and hand scribbled, Dear Brother Jeff, I just want to tell you I'm a black brother. I've been hang hanging out with the Panthers and Fred Hampton. They're not what they pretend to be. Uh, Fred, they have a hit out on you. I know what I'd do if I was you. Signed, a black brother. And the, the memo that accompanied that letter said the purpose of this is to get retaliatory action uh, by the Rangers against the Panthers. So Jeff Fort didn't respond. Perhaps he didn't feel this was really a black brother. But anyway, that showed the intent of the FBI that to, to, to use a street gang to, to carry out their, their business. So again, we're building a case. We have this program prevent the rise of Messiah. We have an earlier attempt. And then we get a document, uh, because we keep asking for documents, and Flint Taylor, my partner, was never gave up and was always asking for these things. And a US attorney, I guess, who didn't want to take the weight, we get 34 documents one day, and we go through them. And one of these documents, we look at it, and it's a floor plan of the apartment, showing the living room, the bedrooms, the, bed, the room where Fred Hampton slept, even the bed that he was sleeping in was marked with a rectangle, and it said, room of Hampton and Johnson when they sleep here. And now normally an FBI document, there's many copies made. One goes in the Panther file, in the Fred Hampton file, one goes to DC, and to any other FBI office. There was only one copy of this document made. It was put in the do not file file. But this floor plan was turned over to us. And so when we began doing more and more discovery, we found out that in fact, O'Neill and his control had put the floor plan together, gave it to Hanrahan and the police raiders and with information that there were weapons in the apartment. They told their higher ups uh, who could have done the raid, the weapons are legal, but they told Hanrahan that weapons were illegal. 
So basically they gave him the go ahead. Mm -hmm. And when we looked at the floor plan and we looked at the trajectory of the bullets, in fact, from the front door and the back door, they converged in the area of Fred Hampton's bed. So we saw that, and they kept saying, well, there was, they had kept saying there's no relationship between COINTELPRO and the murder of Fred Hampton. But in fact, the document that said we gave the floor plan to the Raiders was a COINTELPRO document. And shortly after that, we got another document uh, that was a, what we call the bonus document. And it was a document, they gave O'Neill a $300 bonus after the raid uh, because his information had been invaluable to what one FBI agent called the success of the raid. So we had a pretty good case against the FBI. They had the motive, they had a prior attempt on his life, they had the floor plan, and they had congratulatory, the, congratulating themselves on setting up and causing the death of Fred Hampton. Unfortunately, even though we had a good case, we had a terrible judge, and he was determined to beat us. And when he gave the jury a set of instructions, which if they had followed, they couldn't have found for us. He basically said if the Panthers had anti-police rhetoric, or if they had weapons in their apartment, then basically they got what was coming to them. And that was a defense, which of course is not the law at all. But he expected the jury to acquit the defendants. Instead, when they were hung, the judge took it upon himself to uh, acquit the, and, and threw out our case. So we were uh, eight years in, uh, we had our case thrown out. He says the cost against us at $100,000 and $100,000 uh, appeal bond. But we kept on. A lot of times when we wanted to quit, we would say, well, what would Fred Hampton do? And we realized that he would not stop struggling. and. We didn't, and ultimately uh, we prevailed in terms of forcing a settlement against the feds and against the city and against the county. But of course, no one was ever prosecuted for Fred's murder. Uh, and I think, it's I think it's important that when the church committee, which began investigating Watergate and began investigating other intelligence abuses in the 70s and wanted to put restrictions on intelligence agencies, the two people in the Ford administration who fought hardest against it were Ford's chief of staff, Donald Rumsfeld, and his deputy, Dick Cheney. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want any of this to ever come out, and they didn't want any restrictions. So in many ways, they were seeing, they had to wait till 9-11 to put in, implement. But I think the issue of exposing, confronting government misconduct is not just one from the 60s. We still haven't prosecuted the torturers in Abu Ghraib or in Guantanamo. So I think the, the militancy of, of, uh, of, of holding the government accountable for its, its violation of criminal acts uh, is just as relevant today. And I think this, is, this may be the most well-documented case of a political assassination. It's certainly not the only one. But I think it stands for the principle that our, what our government will do if it feels threatened by a young, a young leader. And, before I finish, I noticed that there's a, somebody who was very prominent in the Black Panther Party who's here, as Erica Huggins is here tonight. And I don't know if you want to say a few words before we open it up for questions, but I'm very really honored that you're, that you're here. Sure, whatever. <laughs> It's the truth, the awful mm -hmm. truth. Thank you. And um, I, all I want to say is that this story was replicated all over the country, wasn't it? Yeah. And my husband, John Huggins, who was killed on the um, UCLA campus at Campbell Hall in January of 1969, the, the assassination with Al Prentice Bunchy Carter, Carter mm -hmm. the assassination was similar. The setup was similar. And the results were similar. And at one point, I was responsible for um, sending for our Freedom of Information Act files um, so that we could see what Co and Telpro was doing. And boxes and boxes and boxes arrived. And I was to um, make sense of them and file them. And they made me physically ill. Because you see, you read them, and they're 
blacked out uh, for any third party. However, reading even with the blackouts, there was an intent to murder, to, to harm, to kill, to make invisible, to drive crazy, everything you can imagine and then some. And um, every time I think of Deborah Johnson pregnant in that bed, um, my heart is broken. However, her son is strong and well and active and amazing. And so is my daughter. Um, but it's interesting how crimes, it's interesting how we think of who the criminals are. Mm -hmm. It's interesting when we say those people are violent and that's a bad neighborhood because the violence is in the conception of the United States, if we're honest with one another. So I hope that this is the beginning of a lot of conversations like this and that we keep the conversation alive and that we not be afraid to stay in the conversation when it gets difficult for us to hear because Americans like it.